Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking with former Congress member and presidential candidate Dennis Kucinich. Dennis, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Uh, good to be with you, David, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you uh, at this uh, moment of import. It's been a long time and it's a good time and it's a very strange time. Uh, the other day we had the president worrying out loud about nuclear war on the very same day that his party was cracking down on any Congress member who whispered the word negotiations. Uh, what is happening? Well, it's a, it's a significant uh, error for the Democratic Party to make uh, uh, support for the war a test of party loyalty. I've never seen that happen before. I mean, when I led the effort against the Iraq war, uh, organized 125 Democrats to vote against it, there was no talk about party loyalty. As a matter of fact, uh, Richard Gephardt, who was a Democratic leader at the time, uh, and who went and stood next to President Bush and uh, supported the war, told all of us, he said, look, you got to make your own choice on this. This is one of those issues. Yeah. There's a different kind of uh, feeling in DC right now where uh, things are so polarized. Uh, members are, are, are forced into taking positions that are against the interests of their constituencies and also against the interests of their, of their better knowledge and understanding. Even even when Johnson was there and a war on Vietnam and you were expected to support it and wave the flag, there were exceptions, right? There were there were people who spoke their minds and and objected uh, every now and then, weren't there? Yes, uh, and this is uh, this is why we're we're in a very dangerous period right now, <clears throat> because when uh, consensus develops from enforced support along partisan lines. Uh, being driven at this point by one political party, the Democrats, um, we're we're headed for real trouble because there's then there's then uh, no restraint from a partisan point of view, and to shut down any talk of uh, negotiations or the use of diplomacy to settle what is uh, uh, seems to be mushrooming into uh, a moment of of international peril uh, to sh just shut it down for partisan reasons, shut down that discussion is, is uh, a disservice uh, to the American people and to the people of the world. We, we're losing our capacity for being able to talk to people at a time, <laughs> paradoxically, when it's easier to communicate with people than ever. And- Absolutely. If, if you had been in Congress the past eight months with this uh, war on Ukraine and, of course, the previous war, <laughs> months of, of war in Ukraine, uh, what would you have been saying and doing? Well, I'm, you know, my, as I look at this, uh, it's important for there to be an end game in mind when the country's involved in any kind of uh, international um, action. The U.S. is playing a proxy war in Ukraine. It didn't begin uh, in, on, on February 24th of this year when Russia invaded. Uh, it began in 2014. So the course correction had to, had to start eight to ten years ago. Uh, and you know some of the same people were urging the U.S. to press forward uh, in the Iraq War are are now in positions of power where they're using their influence to press forward in a showdown with Russia at the great sacrifice of of lives and um, home and hearth of the Ukrainian people, and at the loss of lives of soldiers on on both sides. Yeah. I, you know, we have to we have to look at this. And so my my feeling is when I see this thing start to escalate, when I see the Democratic Party scolding members of Congress who are just asking for diplomacy, uh, this is the time to speak out 
and to say, uh, stop funding the war and start looking for ways to resolve this that uh, can achieve uh, the goal of Ukraine to be independent and at the same time can, issue, can resolve the security issues that uh, Russia has set forward. Uh, but right now, uh, there is no talk of that coming out of Washington. It's uh, only of uh, sending uh, signals and words of escalation. And uh, that all is being echoed by uh, major media. And, you know, it doesn't serve any purpose except to put us in that soft circumference of World War III. Even this letter, which was the best thing we'd seen, at least out of Democrats in Congress in eight months, didn't say stop funding the war. It said fund the war to the hilt, weapons, 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 but at the same time negotiate an end to the war. Did it even make sense? Uh, ought it to have perhaps been a bit stronger as well as not being retracted? Well, it, it, first of all, you know, the members of Congress who signed that uh, letter uh, signed it over a period of a few months, and that's not unusual. You know, I spent 16 years in Congress. You can sign your name to a letter. This shows what you believe, and maybe you learn that it's actually delivered months later. That is not unusual that that happened. Uh, what is unusual is that the political forces that came to bear on the individuals who signed that letter uh, uh, were in the interest of continuing the war and of not seeking any uh, negotiations or diplomatic resolution. Uh, this war is not gonna be solved by weapons. Weapons can only um, lead us to a conflagration, the globe. So what are we talking about here? We're at the moment where at least 30 members of Congress were ready to put their name on a letter that said, look, taking this a distance, let's now move towards uh, negotiations and use diplomacy. And to have uh, them castigated by the Democratic leadership sends a worrying signal about uh, the Democrats not only enforcing party loyalty over a war issue, but also the Democrats coalescing uh, on a message that is one of escalation. And that is really dangerous. And, uh, you know, had I been in Congress, I would have warned against that and certainly not participated in this effort to, uh, uh, to press a war and, and not have any talks of, uh, of resolution. I can remember when candidates like John Kerry and Hillary Clinton and even Joe Biden ran into trouble because of their support for starting the war on Iraq. Uh, and now Joe Biden is president. Uh, is it... Is it that people have forgotten? Is it that Russiagate happened? Is it that the corruption and the dollars uh, flowing into the campaigns has increased? Is it that the media is so much worse? What, what has changed to make well, peace you, unsayable? You gave me a multiple choice test and the last box is a check that says all of the above. Um, the but there is one thing that I'd like to uh, caution you and, and the listener, John. Uh, you know, we like to personalize our politics and say, well, it's Biden this and Biden that. There's a group of people in the White House who are op operating rather anonymously in terms of decision making. And the president is a, an exponent of their thinking. Uh, that, that, does that mean he doesn't know what he's doing? No, he knows what he's doing. Uh, this idea of trying to depict uh, President Biden as somebody who's not, you know, thinking about what's going on or is totally out of touch is just not correct. He does know, but the decisions are being pushed by people who have an ideological agenda and have had one for 10 years and more. Uh, and that agenda doesn't fit with the way the world is today. Uh, we are in a multipolar moment. It's no longer the United States just, you know, dictating decisions all around the world. Uh, it, it, it's very expensive to do that, by the way. And we can't do it anymore. The world has changed. Uh, while the world is interdependent, interconnected, it's also, it, we're also seeing as a result of some deficiencies in US politics, the creation of uh, rather loose alliances that are coming around in a, an agreement that they don't wanna be dictated 
uh, uh, by the United States with respect to their economic policies and their security policies. So, you know, and, and to be quite specific, you know, it's not only Russia, it's China, it's India, it's Brazil, it's um, uh, South Africa, it's, uh, you know, as of late, Saudi Arabia and other countries who are just saying, look, uh, we're going to follow our interest, and our interests may not be identical with those of the United States, and you're just not going to strong arm us to tell us what we have to do uh, in order to satisfy the uh, uh, the economic needs of, of America. Look, I voted against the China Trade Agreement, for example. Okay, I saw way ahead of time about where it's going to take U.S. industry. I, I would have voted against NAFTA. I wasn't in the uh, Congress then, but I made repeal of NAFTA one of the uh, planks of, uh, of the platform that I put forward through uh, two runs for president. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the trade agreements right now, and we put ourselves in this fix. The United States did. And, uh, you know, if we don't like it, then let's change our, our policies, but don't create wars over this. Uh, and, you know, how did, how did we end up with these skyrocketing uh, energy costs? Well, we created sanctions that reduced the supply. We created policies that cut us off from uh, cooperation with nations that could provide um, uh, you know, oil and gas. You know, it, it, this was a choice. It, it's not like natural force in the market caused that. Yeah. It's a choice that we made. And if, if we're complaining, and our nation's leaders complain about it now, but hey, somebody's got to take responsibility for the choices that were made. And, uh, and so where does this all lead with respect to Ukraine? Uh, you know, I've been to Ukraine. I, I you know, I, I represented the community that has strong Ukrainian uh, population. And it's heartbreaking to see the carnage that's taking place in that nation. But it didn't just start on February 24th of 2022. It started in 2014, when the United States overthrew a, uh, an elected president in Ukraine and put in their guy uh, and uh, proceeded to uh, take uh, steps to encourage the Ukrainian government to move against uh, Eastern Ukraine, which uh, was, you know, was primarily Russian speaking people. And, and you know, th this was not necessary, but this was, yeah. part, this was part of a, of a, of an effort, a continuing effort to throw aside a, uh, agreements that were made later at Minsk and to uh, continue encircling uh, Russia and create uh, what the Russians saw as security threats uh, uh, under the aegis of NATO. Uh, but what's absolutely flabbergasting about all this is that NATO was never gonna let Ukraine in, the United States wasn't gonna get Ukraine into NATO. Russia was concerned about Ukraine joining NATO. That's how a lot of this started as, as a flashpoint. And this whole thing has been unnecessary. Um, that being the case, uh, diplomacy should be a little bit easier to resolve this, uh, except that the Democratic Party has officially renounced it <laughs> through forcing the rejection of, of, uh, of, a, of a letter sent by 30 members of Congress, which is just a small you know, percentage of the number of the number of Democrats are in the Congress, so th this makes no sense. And uh, David, I want to go one, over one other point. You look at um, in the in, in our lifetime, we've had some very important moments of diplomacy, and you know, few more notable than the fact that sixty years ago, to this very time, President John Kennedy got together with Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union and was able to hammer out an agreement that averted a nuclear war. You know, everyone agrees right now, well, that's what happened. Uh, but, and then you go a little bit further, you go to uh, uh, 1972, where Richard Nixon, a uh, famous uh, hawk and anti-communist makes the initiative to open up uh, uh, diplomatic relations with China. You know, that was unthinkable, but again, it was about you know, it was about diplomacy. And then you can go to um, uh, the Camp David Accords in 1978, where President Carter brought together Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin to finally end the uh, conflict between Egypt and Israel. 
and then you can you know go a little bit further into um, uh, George Mitchell's efforts to uh, bring about a Good Friday Agreement. I, I, you know, recent American history is replete with examples where a State Department that was animated to find solutions to things could could do that. I mean, that's what we, that's what they're there for. That yeah. it's what they're there for. But instead, when you have a State Department which is dedicated to keep, you know, winding up, uh, stem winding a war, uh, that can only end badly for our country and for the world. We're speaking with former Congress member Dennis Kucinich. Uh, Dennis, I really wanted to get your opinion on uh, on another topic, uh, the the war in Yemen, which has thus far killed a lot more people than the war in Ukraine, uh, actually saw the War Powers Resolution used successfully to pass an ending of U.S. participation in that war by both houses when they could count on a veto from President Trump. Uh, and then for two years, nothing. Uh, and there's no Congress member Kucinich we can go to and say, would you force a debate and a vote? Uh, every single member of Congress is simply obedient to their party's leaders. Uh, and uh, the, the general thinking, if it can be called that, that they'll give you is, well, it's better to just leave the threat of doing that hanging out there for years than to actually do it. Uh, am I crazy? to prefer that there be someone in Congress willing to, to force a vote when the so-called leadership won't to, to finally end a war that they gave such passionate, urgent speeches about ending two years ago? Well, you end a war a couple of different ways. One is a, a primitive resolution to bring to the floor and you force people to vote on it. You know, I, I, I did that as you know, on many occasions. Uh, you also ended by cutting off funds for any connection whatsoever with uh, fueling that that fire. Uh, you know, we we are seeing uh, this um, uh, this condition in Congress, which comes from a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, newer members of Congress, you're seldom going to find a new member who wants to take on the entire uh, leadership of his or her party, especially on issues like this, because. You know, if you've only been there one or two terms, you're most for most people, you're just trying to get your way through and you talk to other members and you try to, you know, get your sense of equilibrium about being in Congress. And, you know, it 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 takes a certain amount of chutzpah to uh, just tell uh, Democratic leaders, look, I'm, I don't agree with this. I'm not going this way. And, uh, you know, you have to figure out how to even get time on the floor of the House to express your opinions. <laughs> I mean, that's a kind of, you know, when you get into Congress, you got to figure out all these things and nobody teaches you this. You have to find out on your own. So the newer members of Congress are at a disadvantage immediately. Um, and to have a more senior member, it's unlikely they're going to take it on because a lot of them hold important positions in the Congress. So, uh, you know, committee chairmanship, subcommittee chairmanships. And it just that's the way the system is set up. It can reward people who uh, who support uh, uh, party views and can punish people who don't. However, what further complicates it is something that you just raised. And that is, if your party has control of the White House, uh, you may not be inclined to do anything that would challenge the White House. Now, Speaker Pelosi has historically been very supportive of any Democratic president. And that's something that it shouldn't be surprise anyone, uh, because there is a sense that uh, we, you know, we hang together collectively or we hang individually. And so uh, she has been very supportive, and she works uh, cooperatively, collaboratively with uh, the White House. Uh, that's how the trip to um, Taiwan came about. It wasn't because, in my opinion, it wasn't because she initiated it. It was because she was asked to do that by the White House. And they had plausible deniability. Well, the speaker has her own approach. No, she she never has ever made a move that would be contrary to a Democratic White House. And that's the way she functions. That's the way that she has wielded power. And, you know, if you understand that, it's easy to figure out what's going on. 
I, similar question, Dennis, the, there's always a, a vote every year on a bigger than ever pile of money for the military, even when you've put in power a party with a party platform that says take money out of the military. And there's always a handful of members who once the vote happens and it's sure to pass, will vote no and then run around telling everyone they voted no. But there's never a single member who before the vote happens will try to organize other members to vote no unless the number comes down. Uh, and a couple of years ago, there was going to be this defense spending reduction caucus and they were going to do this, you know, and then I guess you got a Democrat in the White House and it just evaporated. But am I crazy to think it would be better to organize a, a group of no votes on the spending bill in the House and not need the Senate and not need the White House than it is to keep putting forward these bills uh, to reduce military spending? They'd get, you know, a dozen or two votes, uh, you know, co-sponsors, but if it were to ever actually pass, would need the Senate and the White House uh, to take well, let, me, let, let me um, uh, answer this. Uh, first of all, from my own personal experience, through 16 years in Congress, uh, maybe one of the first votes that I ever took, I, I may have and voted uh, for part of that um, Pentagon budget. One vote, maybe. Next, part of 16 years, I didn't vote for a single one of those budgets. Why? I sat in hearings where we were told back in 1997 that there was over a trillion dollars, T for trillion, in accounts within the, within the Pentagon that could not be reconciled. Trillion, that was, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah. I looked at that and I said, they can't keep track of this money. Right now, as we're speaking, with the tens of billions of dollars going to Ukraine for weapon systems, they can't keep track of it. They don't even have a system to keep track of it. Mm -hmm. And the Office of Inspector General has bemoaned the fact that I think it's 70 percent of the weapons can't be can't be traced. And, and, and quite likely, they're not, you know, they're a small amount of it is going to Ukraine and the rest is going to the black market. And uh, people are, are selling it and it's going around the world and who knows where they'll turn up. Uh, you know, this. Yeah. So, so you look at the you look at the budget. And you realize how money can be misspent. This is U.S. taxpayers' dollars. These people work hard, and they pay uh, their taxes, and they don't expect it to be wasted. But the whole budget's riddled with waste. So that's why I couldn't vote for it. Uh, then you go to what happens on a uh, on a on a budget debate. Very few members get a chance to speak. Most are discouraged from saying anything. It's basically settled between the chair of appropriations uh, and the ranking member of appropriation. Done, okay? The next thing is, uh, you got people who will come from your district who one way or another are benefiting from that budget. And they'll lobby you and ask you to vote for it. It was hard to say no to people who I knew, but I'm sorry, you know, I can't, I, I can't let the, uh, a budget that I know is riddled with waste, fraud, and, and other types of corruption uh, be imposed on the American people and vote yes for it when I, you know, when I know better. So the, the pressures for people to vote for this, you know, the flag waving that goes on and, well, look, we're on, a, we're on the verge of a big war and you're not going to give America the money it needs to fight. I mean, all these arguments are going on and it's generally a con job. And if you, um, if you fall for it once, you'll fall, for, you could fall for it twice, three times, four times, 10 times, 20 times. It just never ends. That, I mean, that's, you know, I, do I approve of it? No, I told you, I probably 95 to 100, 95% of the time I voted against it. But I know the pressure to go on. And we had, we did have a, uh, an alternative budget in a progressive caucus that we presented that sure. resulted in, in significant reductions in, in uh, Pentagon spending. Uh, and we set it forth and we did it uh, ahead of time. And we voted on it, and it got voted down, of course. But, but you know, there are people who tried to do that. But then when you get to the moment of voting on that appropriation, 
uh, the herd instinct takes over and very few people will vote against the uh, Pentagon's uh, appropriation because they don't want to be called, uh, you know, a commie or uh, a collaborator or a no good Nick, you know, yeah. so it goes. We, Congressman uh, Dennis Kucinich, we've got just a couple minutes left. Uh, there are worse things than being called a commie. Nuclear apocalypse is pretty high on the list uh, for, for whoever we have in mind and everyone else on the planet. Uh, and in this moment, I'm being told, you know, you need to support Republicans. They're the only ones who are anti-war, who are going to stop the weapons shipments to Ukraine. Uh, you need to listen to Henry Kissinger and Elon Musk and Tulsi Gabbard and, uh, and, and, and who am I thinking? Well, Donald Trump. You need to listen to these people who are against the war. They're there for peace. Uh, not quite sure that's right. What do you say to the- well, war, shouldn't, war shouldn't be a partisan issue that it has become a partisan issue with, in my estimation, the Democratic Party on the wrong side of it, favoring the war, uh, is, uh, is dangerous. Uh, it is, it's a good thing that Republicans have voted against uh, measures that would fund more war. That's a good thing, and we ought to be grateful for that. Uh, you know, I worked with uh, Republicans over the years to try to block certain appropriations or authorization for wards. And you got to, we have to have that kind of communication going on. And I want to thank the, the people who have said, yes, I mean, you know, we got to encourage that. Uh, as far as the, what people vote for in the November uh, election coming up, um, you know, that's a, a, a local decision, but it will have national implications if you're voting for someone who is an avowed um, hawk and is uh, favoring more war. You have your, whoever you're voting for, you need to look at that. Are you voting for someone who is basically pledged to keep this thing going? Because I sure am not. I can promise you that. I'm just afraid the people speaking against it want a war on China, <laughs> want a war on the poor, want a war on people well, who look like them. David, hold on. You know, uh, this the, the trip uh, to China and the bellicose words that uh, attended it, uh, theoretically, based on what was said there and based on what's being said with respect to uh, uh, Russia, no negotiations, are we not learning anything from history? Are we really prepared to fight a two-front war, one on the uh, west uh, with China and one to the east uh, with, with Russia? Are we really going to do that? Can we, you know, first of all, can we afford it? Uh, do, do people want to send their sons and daughters for this? Do they do they think for a moment that it wouldn't be nuclear? I mean, these are the kinds of things people need to think about. Look, you know, because you and I worked together on this back when we were opposing the Iraq war. I pointed out uh, in October of 20, uh, two, 2002 that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destructors, no proof, that Iraq wasn't involved in 9-11 that it didn't have the intention and capability of attacking the United States. I passed this analysis out to hundreds of members of Congress. Uh, it may have made some difference, but we still went to war. We had millions of people opposing, we still went to war. This type of thinking right. is still present in the US government. And it's, it's, it's really a, non, a bipartisan type of thinking. It, this ultimately is going to be a discussion about what is the proper role for America in the world, and are we going to focus on trying to run the rest, rest of the world, take, you know, tell the rest of the world what to do, or are we going to start to think about poverty in America, about wages, about jobs, about education, health care, retirement security, these kind of economic issues that people are riveted to, about crime, which is an economic issue as well. You know, these are the kinds of things that if we don't start paying attention to, we're, we're, we're falling apart from the inside while well, we're going around the world telling everybody else how to live. What? I, w I want to ask you to keep going for the next hour, but we're over time and the, and the show has to end. Uh, former Congress member Dennis Kucinich, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you very much, uh, David Swanson, and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. 
This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.